is David Morgan of themorganreport.com. And I have uh, Tom McNeil with me from Omanica, and we're going to visit that project here. But before I do, I just want to give a general outline to why gold, why now, or why silver, why now. And I think anyone that will be following my work or what Tom does for a living knows that gold is paramount in importance, especially now with the financial system that we are presently confined to, which means that unprecedented money printing by governments around the world dilute the currency that is already in existence. It's watering the milk and it never works. Unfortunately, that's the state of affairs and you could justify it or not. I'm not here to get into political debate. I'm merely here to state that I have believed for a very long time, once I determined how the financial system actually works, that a hedge position is required by all investors or basically by all people. And I advocate that. I think the safest, soundest way to do it is probably with physical metal. However, I've been fascinated by the resource sector from a very early age and devoted most of my life to studying the resource sector from a top-down perspective, meaning why would you buy a gold mine unless it's a good idea to have gold? And with that in mind, I've looked through the sector, top down again, top tier, cash rich, unhedged mining companies, royalty companies, mid tier producers. And every now and then there's a speculation. And I am very particular because it's the hardest part of the industry to get right. And yet it's the most heavily advertised part of the industry. So Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you, explain the who you are, what you do for those that don't know, and a little bit about Omanica, and we'll take it from there. Sure, okay. Uh, Omanica has been uh, in existence as a company since 2012. Uh, it was created as a spin-out of another mining company. You, I think you're bang on that uh, uh, basically there's a reason that people want gold companies is because they want to own gold. And the easiest way to do that is to buy shares in a company that's either exploring for it or has some gold in production. Uh, Omanica was created in 2000 or 2012. And it spent the bulk of its life idling, I guess, is a good way of putting it up until this moment in time, when all of those background macroeconomic factors have come into play to give us what a lot of us perceive to be the beginning of the next gold bull market. Uh, we've been holding this company back, if you will, uh, until this time. So we have a unique situation with Omanica. It's a, a different story, if you will. It's a 160-year-old story in some senses, even though the company was only created in 2012. The Caribou Gold Rush is, without question, the richest gold field in Canadian history. Uh, initiated in 1859, 1860, there was millions of ounces of gold liberated out of the Caribou Gold Fields, mostly placer gold. In fact, in the early days, entirely placer gold. Uh, and uh, it's become such a unique story because of a, a bunch of quirks of fate that I can go into in a little bit. But basically, long story short, Amanika is a specific built company to wrap around a placer gold deposit, very high grade placer gold deposit that has a tremendous amount of load gold potential, meaning of where did that gold that's in the placer deposit come from, load gold potential in the immediate vicinity of the wing dam deposit. So is there, you know, maybe there's some specific things that you want to talk about, Dave. Yeah, well, it's been a while since we were together uh, in British Columbia and I uh, brought you as a guest of mine, which is uh, the Metals Forum, where basically the newsletter writer personality actually asks certain companies, so sort of a, a nod of the head, so to speak, that, hey, I really like this company, and here's why. And of course, you did a great presentation with uh, Dean Nawata, who actually uh, was sitting next to me during the presentation, and then we followed up with an interview with you later in the day. So from that early days, and again, people watching this may be familiar with that or not, maybe they're hearing the story for the first time, but there's something about this project that I consider a bonus, and that's the underground alluvial gold mining track to the Widom project. Uh, there's impressive grades that we know about, and yet you also have near-term cash flow. Would you like to discuss that part? Uh, sure, and by the way, thanks, David, for taking the time today to, to update, I guess, and to talk about this. Now, Wing Down is a project that has been attempted for over a hundred years. It's a very rich underground alluvial, so paleoplaster gold, that has an analogous deposit about 10 to 12 kilometers upstream the, uh, in the area of Stanley, British Columbia, that was mined out. So 
uniquely, this is 50 meters beneath Lightning Creek, which presents its own problem, but that Lightning Creek is the reason why the gold dot deposit exists. I mean, millions of years ago, Lightning Creek was 50 meters lower, and it's been building through erosion of the mountain sides, and it's been lifting itself up. But back in, in the time when it was cutting through the bedrock, it was depositing gold on bedrock that's been emplaced under the creek. That creates a, a mining challenge, but typically that's easy to deal with in the sense that you just go underground and you dewater it, uh, let the material uh, consolidate after dewatering and conventionally mine it. Mine it. In the day back when the uh, gold at Stanley was liberated, uh, they were just using regular timber sets, mining it and having tremendous results. They mined out kilometers of that deposit. This one didn't because it's got because something called the caribou slump. So it's a lacustrine silt, so a lake bottom silt over top of the gold in some places, because at the time of the ice ages, this was covered with, well, essentially the ice dammed up the river flows in the region and created lakes, and you end up with lake sediments on the bottom of it. And what that means in a mining sense is uh, it's very challenging because it retains water, and you've got the creek above it, remember, and it retains water, and when you go to mine it, uh, instead of being able to just typically dewater it and start mining, what happens is this stuff starts to ooze eventually. You'll, you'll set a mining room up, and eventually the walls turn to toothpaste, before you know it, you're up to your ankles in water, and next thing you know, you're leaving the uh, crosscut. So it's been attempted on numerous occasions, but technology wasn't there to do it the way we know how to do it now. So it's a freeze mining project, which is tried and tested in our backyard here in Saskatchewan. It's been used in the potash industry and more recently in the in uranium mining in Saskatchewan. So peace mining and groups like that have really perfected how to do freeze mining. It's a pretty simple process. It's no different than the process used in every hockey rink in Canada where you simply run some brine solution uh, through pipes and freeze the ice to make ice. Well, that's really what we do here, is you go underground, you drill holes into the deposit, you run the piping in, you run the brine solution through it, you freeze the surrounding rock, voila, you've got a competent rock that you can mine uh, simply, I mean, usually with mechanical mining. So what we've got is one of the highest grade deposits in BC history, in, the, in Placer history, uh, that's been on mine because of the technical challenges. And we overcame them in 2012 by adapting the freeze mining process to this deposit. And almost immediately after we were done, that had such exciting results, the Canadian dollar price of gold dropped by, you know, in 2013, it dropped $500 in one quarter. So we said time to put the, uh, the project on the shelf. My analogy for that is we, we took our sailboat, our nice shiny fancy new sailboat and instead of getting it stuck in the mud we put it in the boat shed and we've left it there until last year so that's where we're at with it now i know from a previous interview with dean that uh there's a similarity i think he called it actually a mirror image of the barkerville gold, barkerville gold project which has been rather phenomenal as far as uh size is concerned that's there are very few these days that are that big a discovery do you care to go into that? I know it's speculation forward looking. I'll give those qualifiers, but nonetheless, it's very intriguing to me that this district is a district play. Could you elaborate on that, please? Uh, it really is. We're on the other side of the terrain. So Barkerville is 25 kilometers to the east of Barkerville Wells Camp. Uh, it was originally in production back in the 1920s, 30s, and some production in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the Caribou uh, Gold Quartz Mine has produced, I, I believe it was 900,000 ounces, and the Island Mountain Mine produced about 600,000. So historically, up until the late 50s, I think, when they stopped production, that complex produced about 1.5 million ounces. Barkerville Gold Mines, which is now Cisco, have drilled off another resource. I believe it's something on the order of about 4.5 million ounces in the 5 to 6 gram per ton range, which means ultimately, even at this early stage down there, that's a six million ounce gold camp, and that's that's large by Canadian standards, and relatively high grade too. So we have an analog in that we're on the other side of the Barkerville terrain. We have all of the same structural controls. We've got the Eureka Thrust Fault, which uh, comes up and over the Barkerville terrain. They have the Pleasant Valley Thrust Fault that comes up and over on the eastern side. We have the same bedrock, which is largely phyllite and argillite and relatively soft metamorphic rocks. And uh, that's what makes this so interesting and explains why there's so much plaster in the region. The rock that was hosting the low gold is actually pretty malleable. It's soft. So when you have erosional factors like ice ages and wind and weather, that rock breaks down pretty easily. And that's what enriched the streams in the area. And the true analog is that Williams Creek uh, is pretty much tied with Lightning Creek as the two richest creeks in Canadian plaster mining history. And, uh, you know, they're, they're 25 kilometers apart and they have headwaters that essentially start at the same place and run two different directions. 
So there's a, a genuine interesting analog both in bedrock geology and why the placer got degraded from the host rock and into the streams in the first place. So one of the neat things we've got going for us is in the seven years that we've had this project, I shouldn't say it's been idling because we've been doing a lot of geotechnical work, engineering work and, and other geological investigation to advance it, but quietly. While we've been doing that, Barkerville is, has, you know, passed up the food chain, if you will, to Osisco gold mines, who are some of the best explorationists in the world. And they've done a tremendous job of understanding the geology in the region, how to find gold, the nature of how it's in place at Barkerville. And we get to piggyback on that wonderful information for the work that they've been doing in this intervening period. So we know that we've got, uh, based on all of that information and what we know about the geology in our area, it is a genuine analog. And we're excited to get started on the low gold potential. I've got a, I hope this works. I've got a couple of pictures I wanted to show for, for the viewers on this that explain why we're excited. And one of them is the part of the results from our initial bulk sample in 2012. I don't know if you can see that or not. I'll hold it up to the screen. But when you look at this, you can see that we've got gold nuggets that were liberated from our paleoplacer that really haven't traveled that far. And for, for maybe a characteristic, and we'll see if we can put the slides up instead of me holding this up. Uh, but basically, you've got a way of determining how far gold has traveled from source. And when you look at this, you'll see that we're over in this category here where they're really un... They haven't been flattened, the gold grains. They've got quartz inclusions in them. And a lot of these things, I mean, long story short, this chart tells us that a lot of this gold that we found didn't travel very far from source. And it's our understanding that some of it literally is probably right underneath our paleoplasma. So that's what makes it so exciting. We also know that there's multiple sources of gold that charge the paleoplaster that we've recovered. So there's, you know, at least two and possibly multiple potential load sources in the immediate vicinity or very close to our paleoplaster operation. Great. Thank you, Tom. One of the things that I do as an analyst and especially on the speculative side is I try to nail down as many facts as possible, which is almost impossible on a pure exploration, you know, greenfield type of situation, which we don't do that often. Here, what intrigued me was so many things, but one of them was the fact that you've got the alluvial gold, you've got a contract, it's a fixed rate contract. So as a finance guy, I just get all bubbly because now I can do, you know, analytical work on the back of a napkin and figure out what the potential cash flow of the company is, especially when we have what's normally a variable cost, extraction, and it's not, it's a fixed cost. Can you go into that a bit? Yeah, one of the reasons we did that is we do not have a 43101 compliant resource, nor are we likely, a resource calculation, nor are we likely to get one anytime soon. Placer gold, as you know, is typically mined in private entities. That's why when we spent all of the money doing the initial bulk sample and investigation back in 2012, we did that in a private company, CBG Gold which is in fact uh, still, still exists. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of Amanika Mining. Uh, the reason you do that is a variety. One, it's hard to calculate a resource on Placer because of the intense nugget effect of the fact that the gold is trapped in certain riffles in the bedrock as you move along the stream. So you can drill right next to an area that's rich in gold, but if you're six inches away, you're gonna get nothing. And six inches later, you get a fissure that's filled with gold and you've got Bonanza grade. So it's difficult. You'd have to do a tremendous amount of work so we made the choice to just go bulk sample it, get an idea of what we think is there and then move forward. But then the reason you end up with it in a, in a public company is because we became aware in 2012, that, holy, there's probably some load sources very, very close to this. So that's a candidate for having it in a public company because people understand that. So the cash flow that we're talking about, we've got the fixed price contract because people can understand that even without a 43101, con uh, excuse me, even without a 43101 resource calculation, we're not putting any upfront cost into development of the bulk sampling and then presumably the mining of this operation because we've already done that. So our partners, the relationship with them is they bring their capital equipment expertise, all of their underground mining ability, initiate pump. They've already started working last fall, by the way. They did quite a bit of work in 2019 and rehabilitation. But they bring all of their expertise. They get it to the point that they start mining it in the, excuse me, in the bulk sample phase. And as soon as they break through into the pay channel and start liberating gold, they will own half the project, which means they will keep half the gold as they mine it. When they give us our half, they're going to give us a bill at a rate of $850 Canadian per ounce. 
So right now we've got 2350 Canadian. So you can do the math on that first ounce that they give us. We would make a profit of $1,500. We're not going to talk about how many ounces we expect. We point people to what we recovered from the bulk sample, which was 173 and a half ounces out of a 23 and a half meter long drift, a standard eight foot by eight foot cross cut, 80 feet long. We got 173 ounces. The uh, bulk sample, the immediate area of interest, 300 meters, will be 125 of those. So 125 cross cuts that will be roughly the same width, maybe some wider, some narrower, into this deposit. So we're as excited as anybody would be to say, okay, let's get mining. Uh, we'll see what we get. And there's a visual that I have to point out. One of the things that we find exciting about the Paleo Passer, so you know, people can make an estimation what they think we might get. But when we look at uh, geotechnical work we do, all of this salmon colored area is, is a seismic reflection that we've done on the paleo channel. The gold area is the actual paleo placer bedrock uh, old riverbed. This is where historical work suggests that it would be. The yellow is what we found that it actually is by seismic and some geotechnical drilling. But the really exciting part right here is where we did our 80 foot long cross cut, so 23 and a half meters. We came down the workings, went that way across. Now we're just gonna repeat that 125 times down the first 300 meters here. But the neat thing is there is one, two, three, four, five significant depressions in the bedrock contours of the old river channel. Now what that means is that's where gold usually gets trapped typically. So we have a pretty high expectation that there will be enriched zones in lower areas of the old creek bed. That's an exciting prospect. We came in on a shoulder, we were up pretty high. We got a significant amount of gold out of that. Based on the non-compliant resource that was calculated in 1986, and I have to point out, Wright Engineering is one of the best engineering groups in the world for calculating resources of any kind. They did a placer resource calculation in 1986 and over a 1500 meter stretch came up with 66,000 ounces of net potential. Uh, we had an expectation going into this first cross cut based on that, and we nearly doubled our own internal expectation. So we were surprised, we got really excited about it. We've had a seven year hiatus in the middle where we've done a lot of work in the background. Now the gold price is telling us, get underground, start liberating gold, let's find out what's in the bottom of those five potholes in the first 300 meters, and then go get the rest of the 2400 meters immediate area of interest. Very good, Todd. So I'll keep my finance hat on. And first of all, this is a recommendation in the model portfolio and the speculative section of the Morgan Report. I own the stock, so that's full disclosure. Having said that, can you give us, uh, I already know the answer, but I need you to say it, the share structure and the price performance so far. Uh, we just recently raised uh, 1.5, a little over $1.5 million. Uh, and we priced that at 12 cents with a full warrant at 20 cents. Uh, stocks responded very well to the activities that we've started on site already. The share structure is really important. When we went into that financing, we had 84 million shares outstanding. When you add up insiders and the original founders of the company, CBG Mining, the predecessor of Amanika, and all of the people involved with the original bulk sample at the private company stage, there's really literally about 20 names that control approximately 75% of the stock. And they're all vested in seeing the project through to its ultimate fruition. So you have a situation where you have a very tightly held stock. We added, I believe it was 14 million shares on the financing. So I think we're at 97 million shares uh, undiluted and probably I think it's about 110 or 115 fully diluted, I guess it would be. Uh, might be approaching 120. Uh, but we've got one, a unique situation where it, it genuinely is an incredibly tightly held company because all of the people involved were first in it for the placer gold and the actual prospect of cash flow out of placer gold mining and then using that for the exploration of the hard rock potential sources around it. Nothing has changed and we've always been very upfront with our shareholder base that if we are successful with our partners in liberating gold from the Paleo Placer project, it's our intention to use 50% for exploration of the hard rock sources in the immediate vicinity and the other 50% in special dividends to shareholders, random special dividends as they happen. So we're not making any uh, suggestions as to what we expect for cash flow. We've left all of the breadcrumbs for people to look at. This is what we've done. This is what we experienced in 2012. This is what the historical record says about the Paleo Placer. This is a whole record of 160 years of placer mining in the area. 
We've got some of the best technical guys in both plaster and hard rock mining in the region involved with this project. It will be what it will be as we develop that, and we view it as a really excellent potential cash flow opportunity. It's kind of one of those uh, pay your money and you take your chances, I guess, to use the old adage, because we, are, we just don't have any interest in spending 10 to $20 million drilling off a compliant resource calculation on a deposit that we've already liberated a significant amount of gold uh, from and have a partner that's willing to take the risks with us and go mine. Well, you're not the only one and you know, not to dilute the conversation much, but you know, Impact Silver pretty much run uh, a successful mining operation without a 43101. And there are others that I'm familiar with. So it's not an absolute requirement. And of course, what's so intriguing about this is one, the size potential on the hard rock side, but you got immediate cash flow from here and you're not going to just, I won't say squander it, and, uh, but, I, but <laughs> you put a lot of money in a drill program and end up nowhere. And believe me, I know, and you probably know many more than me, but I've been around a few blocks and, uh, you know, I've seen many times in the ups and downs of the industry where there was, I'll just make up a number, $20 million done in drilling. And then the cycle's low and, you know, someone picks up the whole project for, you know, a million and a half bucks. And there's $20 million that went into that project. And, you know, it's, it, that existed at one time. The point I'm trying to make is this. You're in a unique situation. You've got positive cash flow right from the get-go with a huge potential outside of it. You're going to take some of that money and you're going to go explore what the possibilities are, which based on Barkerville could be extraordinary. These are the kinds of speculations I like. Something where we've got a guarantee that's going to be really good, or I'll just be conservative and say good. And then on top of that, the outsized potential beyond that is extraordinary. And I don't see these too many of these situations. I'm famous for saying, uh, you know, my favorite is a, a producer that's just starting that has a lot of upside to increase their production rate and expiration potential. And you fit the bill perfectly. You know, it's been a long time since I've been able to discover a situation like yours, Tom. So I can go ahead and wrap it up. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that uh, our viewers need to know? Uh, not really. Uh, one, one observation uh, touching back on the paleo plaster, when we did our bulk sample, we found a certain character of the gold and we've done a morphological analysis of those gold grains. And incidentally, several miles downstream of us, there is an active placer uh, operation that has gold that looks virtually identical to ours. So you can say that we've got a high level of confidence that this continues to run probably both up and downstream and we have over 15 kilometers of potential paleo placer pay channel. Now, one of the things that uh, typically, and I think you've even asked uh, me, is uh, why should people own Amanika? And uh, why would they care? And there's a quote that I've got from Steve Kosis, excuse me, Steve Kosis. It came from our 2012 bulk sample report, uh, which is a 43101 compliant bulk sample report, uh, which I encourage you to read. It says, the deep lead channel contains some of the highest placer gold concentrations historically reported in all of the Caribou mining district and perhaps throughout British Columbia that remains unmined. That's what got us excited. Uh, we love the paleo plaster because it can be a very immediate near-term source of cash flow, about a month to dewater once the pump starts, probably a month's worth of underground workings and advancing uh, the development drift, the access beside it, and then a month uh, of getting things underway. This can be a several months away project where we actually produce cash flow from the bulk sample immediately once they break through into the pay zone. And the thing that gets me excited about that is we want to go look for the hard rock load source. I've been in the mining business, in the gold mining business especially, literally my whole life, uh, starting with exploration out in Columbia with my family back in the late 60s and early 70s. The hard rock potential is the most exciting thing I've seen in my career, and I've been doing this for 35 years, more than 35 years now. So we're genuinely excited about this, and it's been great that we have such a senior, let's call it, expert group in the neighborhood in the form of Osisco doing such great work just down the block on the very same geology that allows us to piggyback on their work and go save a lot of money doing things, of, you know, not doing things that we shouldn't do. So. Um, thank you very much for your time. I look forward to our next update. Great. Thanks a lot, David. Appreciate it.